Any kids in the audience before I say her name? <laughs> so, <laughs> Roberta Gregory is the uh, cartoonist behind it. The character is called Bitchy Bitch. Uh, Roberta Gregory, her father was Bob Gregory. He used to write Disney comics. And her mother was Mexican, so she's half Mexican. Um, her character, she, she did a lot of independent, underground, uh, like feminist women's comics. She's really big in that scene. And at one point in 1990, I believe, she started doing this comic strip for uh, Fanagraphics, one of the well, yeah, one of the great uh, alternative comic book publishers here in the U.S. We'll hear about them again momentarily. So um, I may have another slide. I'm not sure if I had a, maybe one of her covers. Yeah. So Roberta Gregory. Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, that's, a, that's definitely a 1970s title. That's a Marvel comic magazine. They used to put out like magazine-sized comics uh, with these, oh my God, gorgeous painted covers. Um, so the White Tiger was a Puerto Rican superhero. He's a martial artist, kind of like the Black Panther, except he's all white, basically. Uh, and it was created by a writer, Bill Mantlo, and artist George Perez. George Perez uh, was a Puerto Rican artist working uh, at Marvel, and it's one of the first things that he uh, came up with with the writer Bill Mantlo. And I remember, uh, can we see the next slide? This is about where I come in as far as like, when I was a kid, this is one of the comics I bought. And so that's probably about the first time I heard about the White Tiger. And reading the comic, you know, Bill Mantlo, God bless him, he would try to throw in some Spanglish here and there. <laughs> and even the Spanglish was wrong, and you can't figure out Spanglish, how can it be right or wrong? But so, but as a kid, reading that, reading that comic, at least that character, I was kind of like, like a little light bulb in my head, like, oh, that's cool. I can read a little couple of Spanish lines in an American comic. Um, you know, it's fine reading the comics without any Latino heroes, but then once you see the first one, at least me, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. There hasn't been any Latino characters in com the comics I was reading. So a little, little light bulb goes off in my head at that point. Now, I don't think no one's heard of this, but I may be wrong. Uh, Lampago, this is a self-published independent comic book by, written, created and written by a judge. Judge Margarito Esparza, he was a judge down in Texas. And what he has said, what I've, what I've, written, what I've read was, you know, as a judge, he was tired of always having to, you know, see like young Latino Mexican people coming into this thing and he's got to, okay, you did this crime, you did that crime. He goes, maybe I'll create a superhero, something that will inspire them and such. So he, he didn't draw the comics, but he did create it and he did write it. And he only did three issues. And I mean, if you can tell, like this one, it's very yellowed. I mean, it was really done just on like cheap newsprint paper. Um, and I think there's another slide that's got the two other covers. So he did three issues. This is uh, 1977, approximately. Around the same time, The White Tiger came out, maybe a year after, but this is kind of considered the first Mexican-American comic book character because it was by a Mexican-American uh, author, and then the character himself was Mexican-American with the White Tiger being first Puerto Rican, so. But anyway, these are all Latino characters, so. So that, that's an important milestone that not too many people know about, unfortunately, and um, I heard different things about you know, like the family, because people say, well, why don't people pick up the rights and you know, do new stories, but. There's you know, issues with that, but anyway, deserves his uh, spotlight, I think. <clears throat> I saw the eyes light up, nice. <laughs> the indie fans, Love and Rockets. Um, this landed like a bombshell as far as the historical aspect. So this is actually the Love and Rockets comics by these uh, three brothers at the time, no relation. Uh, Hernandez brothers, they're famous in the industry. Uh, Mario, Jaime, and Beto Gilbert Hernandez. Uh, they're young Mexican Americans at the time um, from Oxnard, California, which is north of Los Angeles, like a, like a kind of like a farming community. Um, they grew up, their mom, you know, ha always had comic books in the house. They, they read everything. They're big, they're big Dicko fans. I've talked to all three of them. Um, you know, they, they love Kirby, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko, and you know, a lot of other, a lot of other cool stuff. Um, let, me, let me tell you one of the Ditko, one of the Ditko stories. 
So I told her I'd do the Latino Comics Expo. So one year we were in uh, Modesto. We kind of moved the show around. Modesto is uh, like uh, Central California. And so we had the Hernandez brothers. We invited them. You know, if you can have a Latino Comics Expo, you want to have the Hernandez brothers as your headliner. And they love our show because it's a smaller show. You know, it's more intimate with their fans. And of course, they get their hardcore fans show up and such. So after the convention, we go to the after party, right? Everyone loves an after party at a comic uh, convention. And we're sitting there in the bar. And then um, Gilbert, uh, one of the brothers, he goes, hey, let's play, a, let's play a game. Let's play a Ditko word game. Like, he's all, let's name the original Spider-Man villains. And then someone names the villain, and then the other person has to name the secret identity. Which is, you think it's going to be, right? So if I say uh, Dr. Octopus, I think that's an easy one for most everybody, or at least comic fans. How about when you say Molten Man? <laughs> Come on, you Ditko fans. <laughs> Actually, I, don't, I can't think of the name myself. Know the answer? Oh, I don't remember. I think that was like a next. <laughs> I, I got Scorpion. Oh. Which is, now I'm just forgetting it. Was it Mac? Mac? What? Garvin. Wow, look at it. We need, we need Matt at the Latino Comics Expo. So anyway, that was a fun little game. You know, Gilbert said, hey, let's just do that. Um, what, one of the other brothers, Mario, used to live, <clears throat> oh, that's what the water's for. Used to live in uh, San Francisco. And we had a show there. So then afterwards, like, hey, let's just go to Gilbert's house and hang out. And, um, yeah, Gilbert's sitting there in his kitchen. No, not I'm Mario. I'm sorry, Mario's sitting in the kitchen. He goes, yeah, I was working in my kitchen the other day, remodeling, and the other night I was just sitting here at my table reading my old Ditko Doctor Strange comics, just relaxing with the beer. It's like, sounds like a pleasant evening, I think. <laughs> so Love and Rockets, Mario, the oldest brother, he told the younger brothers, hey, guys, you guys like doing comics. You're always talking about comics. Let me give you a couple hundred bucks, whatever. And you both each do your stories, and I'll publish it in this book. So this is the actual very first book, which I don't have a copy myself. But it's like a self-published, black and white, the whole thing. It's like a Snyder Dicko book. It's just black and white, front covers, everything. Um, so yeah, that was in 1981. I think I have a picture of the brothers after this. <laughs> so Mario got them started, and he only did a few stories in the beginning issues. But really, the Jaime and Gilbert, Beto, they've been doing the thing for, I think it's almost 40 years now. Um, this is my favorite auth author picture ever, though. It's like, yeah, I got whooping cough. Look, take a picture. That's my, that's my author shot. <laughs> and I think I got two, pic two images of the comics. So um, each brother does their own comic. Like, each one writes and draws their own series. So Gilbert Beto, his nickname, he focuses on these characters a lot. Uh, he created his own country in the story, Palomar. And these are more like adult stories, not, but not necessarily meant to be like raunchy pornographic stories, but they're just like adult, like a good rated R film. So there's relationships, there's backstabbing, there's drama. And like, see, you know, this looks like a, uh, just what you think of a Central American, South American village would look like. And then Jaime does his own stories. His, he's got his own universe of characters. We'll check out his work. So I don't know how well this translates out here, but when I first saw this cover, I saw this in a bookstore, uh, Mile High Comics, when they used to have a branch in Anaheim, but that's a whole other story. I saw that cover, and it's like, so the characters in this, what we call like homeboy culture, right, East LA. Um, Homeboy is a little different than like gang member. I mean, the homeboys, they like to dress up and party, but there's hardcore gang members, which, you know, nothing, nothing you want to glamorize. But homeboy culture, I mean, the girl, you know, my sisters used to have their hair like that with the aqua velvet and, you know, the guys with the buttoned up shirt and the pleated pants. But when I saw that cover, I was just like thrown like, wow, check it out. Somebody's doing, somebody called Hernandez, pretty cool. Someone's doing like homeboy comics and these are high, you know, critically acclaimed. I mean, these guys are written about by, you know, all the top, not just comic sites, but, you know, London Times, whatever. They win book prizes for their work. So... And they're just two guys from Oxnard, California. They grew up in a household with, uh, yeah, Mexican culture, but also, you know, reading Donald Duck comics, uh, Marvel comics. Uh, they used to go down to Los Angeles to all the punk clubs. So they had a really good mix of uh, Mexican-American uh, upbringing and culture and such. 
Okay, so yeah, that's like my first little half of the, uh, just give you guys like a, just a quick history lesson. Um, skipping through a lot, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more Latinos that were prior to 80, but not too many actually. That's the whole thing, so. So yeah, again, I'm a cartoonist. Uh, these are some of the images of the covers of the books I've done. Don't be too impressed, because some of these are like, you know, like a reprint, so it's a new cover. Um, or one could be a preview book of the, you know, the full book that came out later, but been busy for the last 23 years doing my comics. So I'm gonna talk about the comic character I created. So we'll start at the beginning, I think uh, where I was born. So, yeah, they made a movie based on me and a song. No, no but I was born in East LA, so I thought I'd use this graphic. <laughs> Some of you have seen this movie, it looks like. Um, my mom's from uh, Mexico. My dad was born here, but early on, his mom moved him to Mexico. They got, she got divorced, so we kind of consider him like, well, he's like Mexican, Mexican, basically. So they got married in Mexico, and then they moved to um, East LA, where his family lived. So, but uh, my brother was born in East LA, and then they moved, and I was born where they moved to a city called Whittier, which some Nixon historians out there know what's, know that city. Whittier is the city uh, Richard Nixon was born in. Whittier was also the city where they filmed Back to the Future, the first one. They filmed it at my high school, and they filmed the Masters of the Universe movie, which I'm sure the only thing, at least one or two people cared about that one. I, <laughs> That doesn't go over too much with most audiences. It's Masters of the Universe. Anyway, so I grew up in Whittier in a Mexican-American household. So in one room, you know, dad could be playing his uh, mariachi music. Then I go over here, my brother's playing The Doors, The Beatles. You know what I mean? On Sunday nights, we get together and watching Spanish, Mexican TV. And then uh, throughout the rest of the week, I'm watching Six Million Dollar Man, Incredible Hulk, Batman. So, and then reading a hell of a lot of comics. So one of the, the characters, this is a masked Mexican, anybody know who this is? Sanchez. Mil Mascaras. Ding! Mil Mascaras, yes. So there, there is a uh, holy trinity, excuse my blasphemy, of masked Mexican wrestlers, Sa El Santo, Blue Demon, and Mil Mascaras. Mil Mascaras means thousand masks. So see this mask design with the M and the, you know, things around and everything? He has a ton of designs like that, different colors. There's a cheetah pattern one, a tiger stripe. Um, something very artistic about him. But as a kid, I used to idolize him because, I mean, he's built like a superhero. I mean, people were working out in the 60s, but it was kind of rare to see someone so perfectly developed. I mean, it's like a Mike Zek drawing, I think, because his legs are kind of thin, but he's really developed up here. Um, but I used to admire him a lot, because to me, he seemed like Mexico's Captain America. You know, uh, more so than Santo and Blue Demon because he would come into the ring, sometimes he'd wear like an Aztec costume that he'd take off, or he'd wear a mariachi costume or he'd come with the Mexican flag. Like he was very, um, very proud to show his Mexican heritage. So as a kid, I used to really admire that. Even though I didn't see much of him on TV, I just look in the wrestling magazines. That was our internet back then, the wrestling mag where you can learn about uh, other wrestlers. So he was a big influence to me as a kid. Uh, you know, among, yeah, among the many shows I loved was The Addams Family, which is based on a comic strip by a cartoonist, Charles Adams, which appeared uh, for years. Um, but the TV show I used to love. So this character, Gomez, played by John Astin, who played the Riddler on Batman after Frank Orchin, but John Astin played the patriarch, uh, Gomez Adams, so he had a little bit of a Spanish accent. And as a kid, I used to trip me out, like, oh, okay, so, like, is a family Mexican, or, because their dad's over. <laughs> but you know what I love about these? I, I don't want to get into the debate, Munsters versus these guys, but I'm totally Adam's family. Herman Munsters, I don't know, he's so dorky, I don't know. <laughs> what I loved about the characters, besides that, I like that macabreness about it, right? It's not, like, really dark or, or, or satanic, but it is macabre and ooky and spooky, as they call them. But they're a very loving family. I mean, he's obviously infatuated with his wife, you know, kissing her up and down the arms every, every second. But they were so playful with the children. I mean, there'd be scenes where he's on the floor playing with the kids, or playing trains or something. And as a kid, like being in the tight, tightly knit Mexican family, 
I, just, I really responded to that. So it was like the perfect show for me as far as like the kooky macabre stuff and then that really close-knit family. And then the other thing, I guess like an artist, you know, the neighbors would come over and neighbors would see you guys are weird. But right, like when, it's, when someone calls you weird, I'm not, you're the weird one. You're square, you are square, dude. So I like how they would just brush it off. What are you talking about? This is normal, this is, you know, this is us. So that, that was a big influence growing up. Uh, another, you know, a lot, I liked a lot of shows, but I was really into the Incredible Hulk TV show as a kid, which is surprising because when you read the comic, right, with all the monsters and the big fight scenes, you think, well, this show is nothing like it. You know, they don't have the budget and it's not really geared that way. But I love the psychological drama. I love Bill Bixby as David Banner and Lou Frigno. Um, I always loved that split character trait, right? You know, the dark side, the calm side, whatever you want to call it. Um, that, that would play later on in my work, but a huge fan of that, <laughs> Incredible Hulk. And then of course, like I said, I was very much into comics. Um, so I was probably about eight or nine when my older brother Albert, um, he was already in, in high school and, you know, so in high school two things happen, you either stick with comics or you get into sports and girls and everything like that. It's like, he was like, okay, I'm done with the comics. So he gave me this big box or two bags of comics, and they were all mostly 1969, 1970, 71 uh, comics. So amongst the favorites were, um, you know, Fantastic Four by Kirby and Lee. <laughs> and this next guy, which some of you may have heard of. Or gasp or something. Wow. Yeah, so Spider Man was such a favorite because, you know, for me, the, the artwork, but like the stories, like that teenage melodramatic angst. Like to me, it was like Morrissey before I heard of the Smiths. You know, it was like, what was me type of stuff. And then the artwork was so amazing and, you know, the predicaments of the character. And sometimes, like, you know, I would think there'd be a Mexican kid under that mask because, like, he had money problems, the police hated him. The media hated him, Jonah Jameson. He had to take care of his aunt, you know. Yeah, I've had a Thea like that, you know. So, um, so yeah, obviously the whole reason I'm here, and this is a big influence, but I'll get a little more into that. And I think there's some other, one or two other samples, or if not. Okay, so, you know, not just comics, I got into real art, which I, I mean, jokingly, comics are real art, but you know, when I got into college, I'd start looking at, learning about painters and sculptors and, you know, illustrators and such. So one of the ones that I really gravitated to was uh, Diego Rivera, one of the great Mexican muralists. Um, what I love about his figure work, it's very blocky. It reminds me of like Jack Kirby's type of, at least the way he thinks of the, the human body, big hands and big blocky appendages and such. And, you know, Diego Rivera would do all kinds of subjects, but he did a lot of things on the Mexican, uh, well, the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Although this is a better outcome here. This guy's fighting back pretty good. <laughs> and there's another artist uh, that kind of influenced me a lot. Uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada. He was a Mexican printmaker. He did all kinds of art. He did a lot of political art, you know, lampooning the politicians, religious figures of the day. But he also did uh, these dancing skeletons, which later really became incorporated to, if you guys have heard Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. Um, I'm sure you've seen the movie Coco, probably, that huge Disney film, the Pixar or whatever. Um, so somehow these end up getting incorporated by marketers or just in general, because the Day of the Dead, what it is, it's on November 2nd, that date I'm sure rings a bell to some people. Um, Steve Dickel's birthday is November 2nd, so that was another bit of serendipity for me when I created my character, but I'll talk about that in a moment. But the, the, the thing about Day of the Dead is not, it's, it's meant to be, it's not the Mexican Halloween. I hate when I read that, especially in a newspaper, like, you don't know better. Halloween is, I love Halloween, but it's meant to be scary and blah, blah, blah. Day of the Dead is uh, I, I, like the Mexican Valentine's Day. It's about love. It's about remembering those who have passed on. Right? Loved ones, family, friends, whatever, or someone, you know, a you know, famous author or something, whatever. Um, 
It's about remembering them on the November 2nd by either going to the grave site and maybe you decorate their, their grave site or you build a little altar at home and you just put mementos of that person. So their favorite drinks, their foods, you know, photographs of them, maybe their favorite baseball cap, whatever. So, um, but this artist, Jose Posada, he was a big instrumental uh, key figure in that. So, in the early 90s, you know, I'm getting the itch to, people go, why didn't I do comics earlier, like get into comics, drawing them. The problem with me, I read too many comic book magazines at the time, back in the 80s, and I'd start reading about horrible stories, what happened to Jack Kirby, about his art and rights and such, and then, yeah, you read things about Ditko and just other artists, too, getting screwed over, for lack of a better word. So it's like, I don't think I want to work at those companies. You know, I just, it just left the icky taste in my mouth. But I started seeing in the early 90s this whole new batch of comics, and so all the ones I'm going to be showing you right now, they're all Mexican-American creators, and they're all self-published independent comics. So this is, I saw this, I think, in Hispanic magazine one day. It's like, oh, what's this? El Gato Negro. You can't even see the word Negro, but it's the Black Cat. It's by a cartoonist called Richard Dominguez from uh, Texas. Um, and then there's a couple, like I said, there's a few more comics we'll just go through. So it's like a crop of comics I was just being aware of in the early 90s. Carlos Saldana, he's from Los Angeles. Uh, Burrito, which is a little donkey. Yeah, this is like more like a fun, funny animal comic. A uh, little talky, talking donkey, gets into time traveling adventures, all kinds of funny things. So I got to eventually meet Carlos. So it's my friend Rafael Navarro, but he's, it's a great comic. So it's a, it's a mass Mexican wrestler comic. We're talking about El Santo or Mil Mascaras. So Ralph was influenced by the Mexican wrestler, but he also loved uh, detective stories, film noir. So he combined it, so it's a private eye wrestler detective. <laughs> so he's got a nice suit, but no, the mask does not come off. <laughs> and um, in fact, this year, he's, Ralph is celebrating his 25th anniversary of his comic. He's putting out a hardcover collection of the first series. I wrote a forward for it, but that's not why I'm plugging it. So um, that, that'll be coming out. Uh, another friend of mine, not, he's a friend now, but at the time, he's like, oh, it's just Pablo's Inferno. And again, this is uh, Rodi Montijo. He's from uh, the Oakland area on the West Coast. And uh, he did this comic about this little boy who, <laughs> he's on his way to the market in the morning, and he gets hit by a, <laughs> A low riding, a low rider driven by a demon. <laughs> yeah, don't have, he didn't, I didn't create that. And the little boy goes to hell. It's like, why would a little innocent child go to hell? But it's a great story, because now he's in hell, now he's gotta get out of hell. So I guess he based some of it on Dante's Inferno, so, but it's called Pablo's Inferno. And that's one of the early comics I became aware of too. And then again, I became friends with most of these people. Yeah, where are the women, right? Where are the female artists? Well, Laura Molina, this is in the 90s, um, she did a, just like a small little mini comic. I can't pronounce the top word, it's an Aztec goddess, but the Jaguar, thanks for making the big English translation, the Jaguar. Um, Laura's very political, <laughs> you know, West Coast. She's a feminist, Latina. Um, so it was a very, it was a very pro-feminist, um, anti-authoritarian comic. So she only did the one issue. She didn't care for the comic industry. I don't blame her in the 90s, mostly male dominated. Um, wasn't a very welcoming place for women creators, you know, even though we, there's, there was been some throughout 60s and 70s. So it's gotten way better, thankfully, uh, today. But, so just one, one comic she did, but you know, that might be the first Mexican-American superheroine in a comic, so. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Lalo Alcaraz. He does a newspaper strip called La Cucaracha. It's been in the papers, I think, some 20 years now. So that was a, one of the first, uh, news, that was the first Mexican-American working in a newspaper that I was aware of, because I was too young for the Gordo comic strip I mentioned earlier. Um, so I, got, I eventually got to know him. He was a big advocate for me and a lot of other uh, up-and-coming Latino creators back in the 90s. Okay, now we get to my comic, as I keep eye on the time here. Uh, El Muerto, El Muerto means the dead, the dead one. Um, that's one of the first drawings. It's from, uh, I think it was 94, 
1994 was an early sketch in one of my sketchbooks. Um, I just want to do this character that somehow combined Aztec mythology and they have the dead folklore. Um, it was probably around this time when I really realized when I thought of Steve Dicko's birthday, November 2nd. Oh my God, that's the same day as Day of the Dead. I could, that was a weird bit of uh, synchronicity, I thought. So that's, that's just one of the early sketches. So that's the first cover. And again, the book is just, was just all black and white, even the cover. Um, yeah, 1998. The, I got like six of those left of the actual first run. It's like, I sold one to a museum a couple years ago in Chicago. And I think I told him like, it was 500 bucks. Go, okay, I'm like, oh, I should have said 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> I always hate when they say yes right away, like, Harlan thought you should have went for 5,000 off the top. So the next one will be 2,500. That's what I <laughs> tell myself. And then when I get to the last three, then it's like, okay, 10,000. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it, but it's the first, uh, it's the fir my first comic, published comic. Uh, that's an interior page there. So basically what this is, is, is this young man, his name's Diego de la Muerte. Of course, he's gonna turn to a character called El Muerto. He's born on November 2nd. So on his 21st birthday, he gets dressed up in his mariachi costume with a skull face. On his way down to the uh, festival, he gets killed in a car accident. He wakes up in the Aztec land of the dead. And then um, the Aztec god of death and the god of destiny, they rip his heart out per the old Aztec sacrifices and then send him back to earth a year later to be their emissary. But of course, he fights against that because he's, he's a good guy, he's one of us. So, <laughs> copyright infringement, Marvel, sorry. <laughs> So, the, talking about character design and such, so the reason El Muerto, I put his logo, right? Every character has a logo or should. I go, where am I going to stick that logo? Because he's, he's got the jacket and the white t-shirt, but if I put it there, well, maybe the jacket may cover it. I mean, I know it's just a comic, but I was, I go, oh, wait a minute. What about, like, Spider-Man had that nice big spider on the back? It's like a nice real estate, like, you know, the back's never obscured. So I, I put the logo on the back, and it works great because it's a black jacket with a nice white skull popping out. It's a very nice spider, Bruce. It's like a squash spider bug. I love it. Not that John Romita stuff, yeah. Uh, I love that, I love it. My favorite spider. I know, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. So anyway, I thought I had to put that in there. Oh yes, the pink sign, yeah, yeah. Can you back it up real quick? Yeah, this is Diego's room. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. That's, they're these are available down the hall. You're welcome, Matt. They're available on the Ditko merchandise table, so think. Always think. Oh, and there's the burrito comic I told you about. I put that in there. And that's one of my favorite uh, paintings, The Scream at Vermunk. So uh, yeah, I just sent some images. I just wanted to share the costume design. You know, I wanted something very simple. Black and white seemed like a natural color choice for a character called El Muerto. Um, you know, what, what type of costume? I go, well, you know what, what about a mariachi outfit? That's simple. It reads Mexican so easily. That's so iconically Mexican, that mariachi suit. So that's basically the, what he's wearing with some, just some little white highlights here and there, accents, and the white skull. and. Simple design, but sometimes simple reads quicker. So, so that's uh, so the black and white cover I showed you earlier was the first book in '98. So I reprinted the book in 2002. I did a bigger print run. I did like 3,000 copies, and I did a color cover. And I distributed this actually through Diamond, Diamond Comics, the comic book industry's nationwide distributor. So they actually did carry the first issue, or at least the relaunch of it, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, just a drawing from my sketchbook of El Muerto, just like a moody piece. Um, hey, wait a minute, I didn't draw that skeleton guy in the back. What's, how did that appear there? No. <laughs> Ooh, people get off. Quick color priest. Yeah, just another uh, symbolic drawing. Like I said, it's not really splitting, but Right, there's this, you know, I talked about Day of the Dead. So, you know, you've probably seen these sugar skulls. 
that they make for Day of the Dead, and they put the deceased person's name on the, on the forehead usually. So I'm just playing with that idea. And I mentioned that Incredible Hulk TV show, right? Split. He's alive and he's dead. So. Uh, in 2007, they made a film. An independent producer and director contacted me. So I, I've had a film made of my comic. Um, I have a little cameo in it. I think you can see it on YouTube. I didn't say that. But <laughs> it's, I think it's up there illegally, but I don't care at this point. I'd rather people just see, it, see the movie. Um, and then the actor under the makeup, that's Wilmer Valderrama from that 70s show, Fez. Yeah, and he was still doing that 70s show in 2005 when we made the film. Um, so yeah, that was a fun film to make there in the... Uh, so for my cameo, I have a cam... Um, we may have a picture of it. There are tons of dicko stories here. So there's me, a long time ago, because you can tell by the black beard, yikes. Uh, that's the costume I wear, that's Wilmer. So there's a scene in the film where he walks into a cemetery for a Day of a Dead festival, and I read the script, I told the director, hey, can I play the guy in the mask? He's like, yeah, but no one's gonna see you. I go, no, but he takes it off, and he says, so it's, I think it's more dramatic, like, oh. So every time I see the film with an audience, you can tell because they're watching the film, like, ah, ha, 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 I'm here. <laughs> Hope that was a good laugh. They're laughing for some reason. <laughs> out of joy, right? Not out of, that was terrible acting. Worst cameo guy since Stan Lee. So I, I, made, the, I made the mask. A friend of mine helped me make the paper mache mask. And then the, um, the production made the poncho. So I was just wearing a black shirt and black slacks underneath. But back in 2005, uh, Fossil had made these collector watches. So I had, there was like two or three Steve Ditko ones they made. So I made sure, no one's gonna see it on camera, but I need my Ditko watch. So it, it's, yeah, it's on, it's on the left arm there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I know, now you guys know. Yeah. That's all I care about. So. Uh, the, one night I was at home, this was 2005, and I was just, I, don't know, I, I saw this on like, what the heck? Like, oh wow, this was at Cannes Film Festival. So just to be clear, they didn't screen the film like at the big palatial theater there, you know. It was shown there for um, distributors. But I can say that my film was shown at the Cannes Film Festival, so. And that was the, yeah, that was the most they mocked up for it. Um, <laughs> nothing scandalous, I'm signing her badge. Not, I'm not putting my, it's not the hotel number, my room number or my phone number. This was at a film festival, I think in Oxnard, Oxnard actually, where the Hernandez brothers were from. It's like, oh, that's kind of a neat little thing. Was, uh, Can you sign my badge? I go, sure, don't move. <laughs> All right. Um, so there's a, there's a second comic strip, you know, in modern times. Um, Baldo, I don't know if you've seen it in your paper, but it's done by two friends, now they're friends of mine, Carlos Castellanos and Hector Cantu. Um, they've been doing it for, I think, 20 years now. But in 2008, they asked me, hey, would, can we, can Alberto show up in, the, in a storyline, in the strip? So the way newspaper strips work, right, Monday through Friday, and Monday through maybe Saturday, and then the Sunday's the big color one. So we came up with the storyline, and um, yeah, it was five parts, six parts, whatever, and then this is the Sunday, the climax in full color. So. Carlos drew the strip, and he left, he left a blank spot where I would draw Alberto. Like, he was gonna draw it, but I go, can I draw it? So it's like, wow, I'm in the, look at, my comic, my character has been in the newspaper strip next to Garfield. <laughs> Not that Garfield's great, but it is iconic. So that's why I remember picking up a bunch of the papers. Is this being recorded? Well, I'll cut this part out. So I put a quarter in the machine for the paper, and I'd take like 30. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, how many times are you going to be in the American newspaper strip? That's like, so you must cut that part out. <laughs> or someone check the statute of limitations. We got a lawyer in the house. <laughs> you guys check on that for me. Thank you. So I think there's a, I think there's a few more. Uh, so this, I did a graphic novel of the character, you know, 140 page story in 2017. Anybody recognize that cover? The homage. The hand? The hand looks like it's from the Eugene Kite. The green one. The Captain America, maybe? 
Yes. America. Captain America and Bucky. And there was a tombstone there. And then I think that was Hitler. So I got yeah, concrete store is a good analogy. And then I think this was the Red Skull. So I made it oh my God of death. Yeah, just, I just figured, oh, that'd be a great way to uh, plug in my characters there. So, you know, when you do something like that, you sign the, you sign the art. Javier Hernandez after Kirby. Give the proper respects. Because the fans will call you out online. So, <laughs> I mean, do it anyway, but. Uh, this is one of the interior pages of the comic where he's getting dressed up to go to, remember, he's getting dressed up to go to the festival. So it's like da 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 da. The Dicko nine panel grid. <laughs> That's just more of the interior pages. The, the God of Death, remember I said while I was interested in introducing Aztec mythology in comics in 98. Um, there was Aztec mythology in comics previously, but was, this was a big part of the story. Yeah, just another page, interior page. So my, the books are usually black and white. They're cheaper because you don't have to pay for color. And time-wise, you know, if I do a 140-page graphic novel, it takes me forever to draw it and ink it and letter it. And it's like, now nah, I got to go through and color it all. <laughs> so I always say, any publishers out there, if they want to do a deal, you guys publish the book in color and get someone to color it. I'll supervise it. But, um, you know, Ditko and a lot of guys, they work in black and white. So there's a challenge to that. Um, it's a big challenge, right? I mean, because you have. You know, you have this whole scene, two guys talking in a mini, a VW minibug. You know, how do you not get lost? So figure out, throw some patterns on the chair. And I mean, if it's successful or not, that you guys can decide. But that's one thing you got to really think about when you're only working black and white. Uh, yeah, just one of the gods from the story, Tezcatlipoca, the smoking mirror. And then that's just, I did another cover for the graphic novel um, uh, for the 20th anniversary, which is 2018. So I'm working on the second book right now. And then I want to get a third one done by 2023, which will be my 25th anniversary of uh, doing El Muerto. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to wrap it up. But today there's, I couldn't even have all the slides for all the comics. To be, being done today by Mexican American or Latino American artist. I mean, this is this young man, Daniel Parada. He actually came to one of our first Latino comic expos and got inspired to create his own comic. And then there's another sample of. Uh, yeah, this is Kat Fajardo. She used to be in New York. I think she moved to Texas. She did a book called Bandita, just like stories about her growing up and, you know, some of the, you know, kooky ideas her, her grandparents and aunts and uncles would bring in with their Catholicism and her trying to f reconcile all that with her life. Let's see what else we got. Uh, this is an interesting book called Quince. So in um, Mexican culture, there's this thing called quinceanera. Quince is number 15. So when the girl turns 15, maybe it's like the bar mitzvah, the parents go broke giving the girl this huge party because it's like, you know, her coming of age uh, party. So this guy got the idea of doing this book. Well, when she turns 15, she gets superpowers for a year. So, yeah, it's called Quince. I go, that was a pretty good idea. Finally, someone did a quinceanera based superhero. Um, so, what little I covered today, there's this professor, uh, Frederick Luis Aldama. They call him Professor Latinx because he's like our Charles Xavier. Um, <clears throat> He's written a ton of books on different subjects, but he focuses a lot on uh, comic books. That's a huge thing the last maybe 15, 20 years, 10 years for sure. There's way more comic scholarship by you know, universities, professors. Um, we're seeing more and more comic art in museums, things like that. And we're finally slowly getting accepted as real art. We knew it all the time, but everybody's catching up to us. So anyway, this is a book that Frederick did. He interviews like maybe 30 independent creators. I was one of the ones that he interviewed. And then he's got another book, which he won an Eisner for, I think in 2019 maybe, or 2018. Yeah, and so this book covers 
Latino superheroes in like mainstream comics. Um, he won a Eisner Award, the comic industry's highest award. So I wrote the afterword for it. So I don't, I don't think that means I won the Eisner. I mean, <laughs> but it's like I wrote the afterword for an Eisner winning book. So then I, there's, I think there's one more sample of a book of his maybe. Oh, so this year is the 10th anniversary of the expo I started, Latino, uh, co-founded Latino Comics Expo. We're supposed to do a live show, but you know, the way things are looking, we're, we're gonna do it online uh, in October. Um, so yeah, that was a poster my friend Ro Rody did, uh, the guy who did Pablo's Inferno. So he did that, that poster for us. And I think that's it. it. Might be a, this was supposed to be the title card, but for some reason it kept putting that at the end. <laughs> like, no, this is weird. Like this is numbered zero one. Yeah. And all the other ones are 02 through 030, whatever. And every time I save the file, it would save this last. I couldn't figure it out. I retyped it. I mean, how can you mistype 01? <laughs> so, anyway, this was my uh, presentation Culture and Comics. I'm Javier Hernandez. <laughs> <laughs>